Welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we explore the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Episode 43 Superhero Games, Part 1. So, for today's show, we're going to dig into superhero role playing games. Now, you might think this is a narrow category, but you'd be wrong. Sure, Marvel and DC have had their officially licensed games over the years, and Marvel's had a bunch of them, if we're being honest, but they're not the only players in this game. So we're going to get into this role-playing history style and break down the various games that have come out over the years, and more importantly, tell you which ones are available for you to buy and try this weekend. So without further ado, let's get this tour bus rolling. Right off the top, we're going to start this look into superhero role-playing games with looks at the two titans of the superhero genre, Marvel and DC. Yes, I am very aware that Marvel and DC aren't the only two comic companies in existence, but if you ask 10 random folks on the street who their favorite superheroes are, chances are pretty good that 9 out of 10 of them are going to answer with somebody from one of those two publishers. Of course, a crap ton of movies and television shows over the years doesn't hurt either. Anyway, let's start with Marvel. Marvel Superheroes, the heroic role-playing game, was released by TSR in 1984. Now, it has to be noted that TSR had gotten into a bit of a bidding war with other companies to obtain the license for Marvel, with companies like Fantasy Games Unlimited, Mayfair Games, and most notably, Games Workshop. However, Kevin and Brian Bloom, who were handling the deal for TSR and basically running the entire company at this point, managed to secure the rights due primarily to their position within the industry at the time and a pre-existing relationship with Marvel due to some comics and other ancillaries that had been handled over the years. In a bit of industry subterfuge, the Blooms kept the license hidden from prying eyes for as long as physically possible, referring to the project internally as the Boot Hill Revision as Jeff Grubb and Steve Winter worked out the rules for the system. When released, the game was a boxed set containing a 48-page book, two 16-page books, cardboard counters, a color map, and dice. Now, it should be noted that one of those 16-page books was a scenario for the game written by Bruce Nesmith. Digging into the system itself, the game has what's called a universal table, which is used to resolve all actions and determine their success. For the purposes of this game, a round is defined as one panel in a comic book, rather than a number of seconds like in other games. So, to determine how actions go during the game, you take a die roll and match up with the universal table and a battle effects table, if it's combat, and you get your resolution. The 48-page book is the campaign book, and it handles character creation, along with providing sample characters for comparison, or for you to use if you just want to test drive the system first. The system also brought in the concept of karma, which could be gained through gameplay. Karma could be used to buy or improve characteristics or powers. However, characters could also accumulate bad karma, and those wipe out good karma before the player could use them. Now, one of the 16-page books, as I mentioned, was a game scenario. It's called Day of the Octopus. It pitted Captain America, Spider-Man, Captain Marvel, and The Thing against a legion of supervillains led by Dr. Octopus. The adventure has six chapters, and the various settings and other items involved in the scenarios are laid out for you within the pages of that book. Reviews of the game were interesting. Some reviewers liked it, while others felt it was too simplistic. I pulled two reviews to share here. Alan Varney's review was in the Space Gamer number 70. In it, he said, This is a respectable effort and an excellent introductory game for a devoted Marvel fan aged 10 to 12. Older, more experienced, or less devoted buyers will probably be disappointed. Enough said. Ken Rolston expanded on this thought in his review in Dragon number 91 in November of 1984. The mechanics are original and simple, the tone is practical and informal, and the presentation is direct and entertaining. The game is much simpler than the Champions, Villains and Vigilantes, and Superworld games, and certainly a better choice for younger gamers. 
confirmed supporters of these older systems will probably not be seduced by the clean rules design, having come to love the chains of their detailed and time-consuming character creation systems. It's funny to me that even in their seemingly disapproving reviews, both Varney and Rolston noted a major selling point for these rules. They're simple to learn, use, and follow. Gamers must have noticed this as well because the system sold well enough for TSR to continue their association with Marvel, releasing Marvel's Super Heroes Advanced set in 1986. Much as with D&D, the Advanced set was designed for the more advanced gamer. There were more rules, more options, just more for gamers and GMs to utilize with the system. Written by Jeff Grubb, with art by Jeff Butler, this was also a boxed set, consisting of a 96-page book, a 64-page book, a cardstock booklet, a color map, and dice. And for those not old enough to remember gaming in the 1980s, getting dice as a part of your box set was a normal thing. In fact, for most of us, the only way you got dice at the time was by buying a box set that had them in them, unless, of course, you were stealing six-siders out of your grandmother's Yahtzee game. Sorry, Grandma. So what was so advanced about this system? The short answer is everything. But let's break it down a little bit, because everything's just not an appropriate answer for this show. First off, changes were made to the Universal Table. It still exists in this version, but it was made a bit more elaborate, which allowed for more variety of results. Characters got more powers, more skills, more weapons and artifacts. See where I'm going here? They also offered up new character generation system by which attributes could take any value and rank was determined by the range into which the score fell. This certainly allowed for a more advanced form of character creation and was also definitely directed towards those who felt that the original box was too simple. Reviewers tended to agree, and I've pulled two reviews to mention here. Pete Tamlin said in White Dwarf number 84, Jeff Grubb has done a pretty slick job, both in expanding the system without overcomplicating it and in explaining it all in an entertaining manner. Tamlin added, TSR seems to believe in simple improvisational games for kids and complex rule-heavy ones for adults. Whether you need Marvel Super Hero Advance depends on how you like to run your games. If you're starting out, providing it's not your first role-playing game, I'd go for the advanced game but be prepared to treat a lot of what it says as guidelines only. Shannon Applecline added in her own review that the set, quote, helped to offset any complaints from role players about the original game's simplicity, end quote. Insofar as support of both of these sets, TSR supported the hell out of them over the years, publishing a large number of supplements consisting of character and setting books, as well as a number of modules for GMs to run their players through. Sales of both sets were good for a while, but as it tended to go with most non-D&D materials with TSR, sales dropped off after the systems had been out for a while, which would lead to periods of time with no new material being produced to support the games, which would then lead some players to go looking for new games or new game systems to scratch their itch for superhero material. However, TSR would take one more shot at publishing a Marvel superhero game. Marvel Super Heroes Adventure Game was released in 1998. This game utilized TSR's Saga system, which I've described in better detail in a previous episode. The basics of the system are that fate cards determine the effects of action, and the number of cards a player can hold is determined by the number of quests they've completed. Sue Cook was the brand manager for Marvel Super Heroes Adventure Game, and she was one of the designers of the Saga system. Now, for this game, there were five suits. The Strength Suit, which were green cards, represented by the Incredible Hulk. Agility Suit, red cards, Spider-Man. Intellect Suit, blue, Mr. Fantastic. Willpower Suit, purple, Doctor Strange. Doom Suit, black, Doctor Doom. Getting into the specifics of the rules for this game, they were designed for fast gameplay with fairly simple rules. Each character had four abilities, rated from 1 to 30. Normal human abilities would rank between 1 and 10, with superhuman abilities, like Thor's strength, ranking between 11 and 20. Each character had an edge, ranked between 0 and 5, which represented their experience as either a hero or villain. 
So edge would determine your hand size, with two plus edge being the number of cards you could hold. Beyond that, the rules dictated what cards could trump other cards, and you'd play along to see who won. Don Bassinthwaite reviewed the game for SF Site in 1998, and he said thus, Good, clear mechanics, quick flow, strong atmosphere, and good background. The support of hundreds of comics doesn't hurt. I think TSR has a winner with this game. He wasn't alone in his praise of the game. Reviewers across the board gave it positive reviews. But let's keep in mind when this game came out. In 1998, TSR had been, for all intents and purposes, sold to Wizards of the Coast. So TSR wasn't really widely pushing a large amount of new product. Wizards was handling most of that as they worked through the last of the legalities necessary to bring everything TSR under their umbrella. What that meant is that this game never really got out to a wide audience, and therefore it faded almost as quickly as it came out. Now, if you can find a used copy of it somewhere, I'd suggest picking it up and playing it for the nostalgia, if nothing else. So, with another game faded away, TSR lost the Marvel license. In 2000, Marvel Comics got the license back, and they decided to dip their toes into the tabletop role-playing game market. Their lone release came out in 2003, it's called the Marvel Universe Role-Playing Game. Designed by Dan Gelber, Jeffrey Simons, Evan Jones, Bill Jemis, and Mark D. Beasley, Merg, as it was known by many in the industry, used a system that was as unique as its nickname. The basic mechanic of the game is the allocation of energy or effort, and this is done through the use of redstones. Redstones are, at first, equal to the character's energy reserve stat and are allocated to powers, attacks, and defenses by both the players and the GM. Allocated stones are then compared to determine success or failure at tasks. On the surface, this sounds like a complicated system, but I've actually had a chance to see this game played before, and once you've done it a time or two, gameplay is actually pretty easy. Or at least it was when I watched it at a convention a couple years ago. Marvel promoted the hell out of this game, putting a 75-page pull-out preview in the April 2003 issue of Inquest Gamer that offered up basic rules and some character profiles to whet the appetites of gamers. It's been reported that the sales for this game were so heavy, multiple printings had to be run for the main book. So why aren't we seeing it still today? Well, apparently Marvel didn't see the game as a success because it didn't do the kinds of numbers that D&D &D was doing, so they pulled the plug on it. Ouch. It sounds like a TSR-level mistake, pulling a massively popular product because it doesn't outsell the best-selling game in the entire world. Well, at least we can still find it used. Maybe. Anyway, the license next went to Margaret Weiss Productions, and they released Marvel Heroic Role-Playing in 2012. Designed by Cam Banks and Rob Donahue, the game was set up to be more of a troop play system, and I have discussed troop play in a previous episode or two. Basically, troop play allows, and frankly expects, players to pick up new or different characters between scenes, and for the storyteller or GM to change about as often. What also made this different is that players are expected to know the capabilities of their character, since stats don't necessarily provide a restriction on what your characters can do. This game picked up three Any Awards in 2012 and two Origins Awards in 2013, but Margaret Weiss Productions never sold a bunch of these units, making their deal with Marvel an unsuccessful one for them. Thus, they announced in 2013 that they were dropping the line and giving up the license. At this point, that's what's out there for official Marvel tabletop role-playing games. That's not to say that the fans of Marvel Comics haven't come up with their own. Trust me, if you dig deep enough into the internet, maybe don't do that. You might catch something. Okay, so we've looked at Marvel's history in the tabletop role-playing game genre. What about DC? Mayfair Games brought us DC Heroes role-playing game in 1985. Designed by Greg Gordon, DC Heroes utilized what's known as the Mayfair Exponential Game System, or MEGS. It should be noted that MEGS was specifically designed for DC Heroes, though it was used later on in a couple of other games. The reason for MEGS is simple. If you look at two heroes, 
For example, let's use Superman and Batman because well, why not? Everybody else does. If we take everything we know about both of them, there's no way Batman should have a chance in hell of standing his ground against Superman should they decide to brawl. Argue this as you will, but Superman's strength is way superior to Batman's, and we know that what makes Batman a superhero is a combination of what's between his ears and what gadgets are on his belt. And a crap ton of money. I mean, we are being honest here, right? Anyway, Megs is an exponential system that uses a logarithmic scale. Long story short, Megs is what allows for the comic realness of a fight between Superman and Batman to seem to be anywhere near even for a bit of time. That feeds into the rest of the heroes and villains in the game. Conflicts in the game are resolved with the use of two ten-sided dice and the action table. Now, for you comic fans out there, you might want to note that DC Heroes released around the same time as DC Comics released Crisis on Infinite Earths, which for you non-comic folks out there is one of the storylines that is considered not only a must-read, but an absolute classic by a number of comic fans. Of course, there are those who say it wrecked the line, but this isn't a comic book podcast. We're going to save that argument for another day. I needed to mention the release point because the rulebook has write-ups for things that happened pre-crisis and post-crisis so that players and GMs had options for running their games. Of the reviews I saw for this version, the average rating was about an 8 out of 10, and we'll rely on Jeff Grubb's review in the September 1985 issue of Dragon Magazine. These are a very user-friendly set of rules that are enjoyable to read without making the reader lose track of what they're teaching. This is the best product I've seen yet from Mayfair Games. But lest the point be lost, let's say it again. This is not an easy or an introductory game. Come into it with some background in role-playing. This edition won the H.G. Wells Award for Best Role-Playing Rules of 1985. And of course, Mayfair supported this core book with supplements and adventures. And to take advantage of the release of the Michael Keaton-led Batman film in 1989, Mayfair released a simplified version of DC Heroes called the Batman Role-Playing Game. That game provided stats for Batman and all his friends and enemies, as well as a full description of Gotham City. It also had a scenario for play that featured the Joker. Jack A. Barker, Greg Gordon, and Ray Winnegar designed it, and it was fairly well reviewed. Now, I mentioned the Batman game because the simplifications that went into that were taken into consideration when Mayfair was putting together the second edition of DC Heroes. It was also released in 1989 with the same designers as the Batman version of the game. This version was also different from its predecessor in that it was released as a boxed set, an introductory booklet, an introductory adventure, and a background roster book with stats for nearly 250 DC characters. It also had the GM screen, an action wheel, two decks of cards with stats for DC characters, and dice. It should also be noted that the Superman source book, which had been released prior to the Batman game, also played into the second edition revisions. Alan Varney reviewed the second edition in the January 1991 issue of Dragon, and here's what he had to say. The game combines broad combat options with speed of play. It quantifies non-combat interaction, such as interrogation, better than any game I know. Its AP system shows true ingenuity and, in the second edition, improved realism. But Varney's review wasn't without some criticism. Quote, This is Mayfair's third try at gadgets and the rules still don't work. End quote. Varney concluded his review by saying, If you find other superhero role-playing games too slow or complex for your taste, and if you don't mind one-table systems, Use the DC Heroes rules as a fast-paced, superheroic combat system for your own campaign world. Mayfair didn't stop with two editions, though. The third edition came out in 1993, and it was a further refining of the rules, and further updated the DC role-playing game world to what had happened in the comics since the second edition was released. More to the point, the release of third edition coincided with both the death of Superman and reign of the Superman story arcs, so the four variant Superman versions got ratings in this version. I wasn't able to find a review for this version, but the sales pretty much spoke for themselves. They 
weren't all that great. At some point prior to 1999, Mayfair lost the license to the DC Universe, and West End Games picked it up. They published DC Universe role-playing game in 1999. Designed by Fred Jant and Nicola Virtus, DC Universe utilized the Legend system. Now, I know I've covered this before, but I can sum it up really quick. Legend system is a D6 variant system by which when you roll the number of D6s you've been instructed to, rather than add them up, you consider any roll of three or higher a success. To succeed at a task, you must have a certain number of successes. Kind of like the die pool system utilized by White Wolf, if you'll remember our discussion of that previously. Anyway, West End put out their core rulebook, then immediately supported it with a number of source books. And these were themed. Anything Superman related was in the Metropolis source book, anything Batman related in the Gotham City book, and so on. West End also put out a series of Daily Planet guides, which were source books written like travel guides to the various settings, written from the point of view of characters involved in those areas, again like Gotham or Metropolis. The game garnered average reviews, and its sales were about as successful. And when Humanoids Publishing merged with Purgatory Publishing in 2003, the license was allowed to expire. Shannon Applecline reported in her 2014 book, Designers and Dragons, that the DC license was then acquired by Games Workshop, but, quote, they didn't use it, end quote. However, Green Ronin Publishing got the license next, and they did choose to do something with it. Now, I do need to point out that Green Ronin was already publishing the game that a majority of gamers think is the best superhero tabletop role-playing game out there, Mutants and Masterminds which we'll focus on in next week's part two. But in their minds, the opportunity to be able to put out official DC licensed product was one they couldn't pass up, and I can't say I blame them. So they cooked up a third edition of the rules for Mutants and Masterminds, then applied the characters from the DC universe to them. That resulting game was DC Adventures, which came out in 2010. Designed by Steve Kenson and Ray Winnegar, with DC artists providing the interior artwork and Alex Ross handling the cover, DC Adventures detailed 14 heroes, 14 supervillains, and provided some detailed area knowledge for Metropolis, Gotham City, Markovia, Zandia, and even Earth Zero. Now, DC Adventures was actually a four-book series overall. DC Adventures Heroes Handbook, followed by two Heroes and Villains book in 2011 and 2012, plus DC Adventures Universe in 2013. And as many reviewers noted, you actually needed all four books in order to play the game. And in case you're curious about the system, it's a D20, which is the same as Mutants and Masterminds. Again, we'll get into more detail about that next week. Sorry, man, I gotta hold something back to tempt you. So if Green Ronin's such a superhero producing force, how come we don't have a DC game to this day? Yeah, well, see, something funny kind of happened there. You see, shortly after DC Adventures got released, DC Comics rebooted the entire comic book universe. Again, you comic fans out there might remember the New 52. So what that did for Green Ronin was it made everything they'd printed, everything they'd put in their source books, it was now obsolete. And it basically killed the line before it ever had a chance. Double ouch. And with that, we come to the end of today's tour. Next week, we get right back into the superhero role-playing game field with part two, and I promise you, Mutants and Masterminds will be the crown jewel of that show. Okay, so last week you might remember that I asked for your help so that a young man I not only game with, but have known since birth, can complete his Boy Scout Eagle project. Well, he's inching ever closer to his goal, but I'd like to get him past it as soon as possible so he can get this project done. All I ask is that you head over to GoFundMe.com and look for Help Aniston Box Fund His Eagle Project. I'll also retweet that and put it back out on the Facebook page if you're having trouble finding the right spot. He'd greatly appreciate whatever you can donate, even if it's just a buck or two. And by the way, I put my money where my mouth is on this one and kicked in 25 bucks to help him out because I believe in him and this project, so please help out if you can. In programming news, I've got a little something I'm cooking up for release in the next couple weeks, but I'm not going to get too deep into it just yet. 
Let's just say I'm going to step outside of the history of games and I'm going to focus on a single game for an entire series of shows. I'll tell you more when I get it completely worked out, but I'm hoping you're going to follow me on this new adventure because it's going to be fun and I think it's going to be a little different. By the way, no matter what I do extra, it isn't going to change this show. I can promise you that. I've got enough game stuff to keep doing this podcast for at least another year, and I'm sure I can come up with more as I go along. So role-playing history is going to keep going no matter what other little itches I decide to scratch with extra stuff. Everything else will be separate from this. Of course, I couldn't do any of this without your support. So thanks for continuing to listen in every week, and thanks for encouraging me to stretch out and try new things. And if this one new thing I'm working on works out, I've got a second one I'm working on as well. Yeah, my wife thinks I'm absolutely crazy. She's probably right, actually. <laughs> the music we use for this show comes from Pixabay.com. Check them out for license-free music you can use for your project. They also have backgrounds you can use if that's what you need instead. You can follow us on Facebook, Role Playing History Podcast, Twitter, at Role Playing P. Our YouTube channel is Role Playing History Podcast, blah, 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 subscribe, you know what to do. Email, of course, I check email every day, I'm old school, Role Playing History Podcast at gmail.com. All right, next week, we do part two of our superheroes tabletop role playing game tour. And in my opinion, these are going to be way better games than the ones we covered today. So you are not going to want to miss it. But that's next week. Until then, I'm Wayne Davis, and you're role playing history.